want to welcome you to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center uh, for a virtual field trip. We're sorry you couldn't be here in person. Hopefully soon we'll be able to do that. Uh, we want to say a very special welcome to Jerry Junkins Elementary this morning. Thank you guys for joining us. Hope you enjoy the program. Hope you learn something from the program. Teachers, if you're watching and you have not registered, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records only. Uh, the program this morning will be fossils and environments. During this virtual field trip, students will identify fossils as evidence of past living organisms and the nature of the environments at the time using models. Mr. Monroe will discuss Columbian mammoths. Ms. Nash will talk about the crustacean period. Ms. Ramirez will present the Pennsylvania period. And Ms. Fuller will tell you all about extinction events. You cannot ask us verbal questions, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC space question, space answer, and uh, send us in a question. And I'll do my best to answer them during the program. And if not, I'll send the answers to your teacher and they can discuss them with you. Now I am going to stop sharing my screen and Mr. Monroe is going to tell you all about the Colombian mammoths. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mr. Monroe, and uh, my part of your virtual field trip today is to lead you on an investigation about a prehistoric organism or a prehistoric animal that inhabited big parts of Texas. Now, we have evidence that shows that these animals were around. And this evidence is in the form of what we call fossils. Now, while I'm doing my presentation, there are two questions that I want you all to kind of be thinking about, because these are questions that your teacher, maybe later on, will ask you. Now, we know that fossils basically, basically are the remains or traces of prehistoric organisms that has been preserved and protected by a certain type of rock formation. And that rock formation is called sedimentary rock, simply because of the way it's formed. And that is the answer to one of your questions that you may be asked later on. And that question is, what type of rock can you find fossils in? Okay. Now, the other question you might be thinking about as I go through this presentation is what can a fossil tell us about a past living organism and its environment at the time that it was alive. And you'll hear me talk a little bit about that as I go through the remainder of this presentation. Now, one of the reasons that I'm excited about talking about the Colombian mammoth, which is a distant relative, or you might say an ancestor of the modern day elephant. Now these mammoths were much larger than the modern day elephant. And I will tell you, they lived, in fact, I'll go back to that part where I was saying, I'm excited about talking about that evidence that was left by the Colombian mammoth, simply because the region that we're located in, in Southeast Dallas County, students, they've been digging out gravel from what we call gravel pits. And about 20 years ago, or maybe 30, 20, 25 years ago, uh, there was a teacher out here who was interested in looking for fossils. In fact, you might as well call him a paleontologist. That's a scientist that goes out looking for fossils. Well, he went to several of the digs and to his surprise where the operators had been digging up gravel in these pits, he found the remains of a Colombian mammoth. And I'm going to show you those remains in just a minute. But that Colombian mammoth, you know, they were found all over North America. In fact, they quickly established themselves in North America. Now they weren't the only mammoth 
you probably heard of another common mammoth that existed so many thousand years ago during the Pleistocene era, ep epoch, 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 and that time period was during the Quaternary period, which was part of the Cenozoic era. Now, you might say, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, that is the time units that were used on a geological time scale. Now, it didn't, set, didn't have a set time for one to begin or end. What made one begin and end was the type of biological life that was living and had ceased to be living during a certain time. And then that time would change. For example, people get excited about the Jurassic period. Well, we know that was the time of the dinosaur. And of course, we know that as time changed, our planet, the Earth, changed a little bit. And it caused a lot of the living things to disappear. Now, going back to the Colombian men, you know, those guys were huge. It was one of the largest mammoths of its time. The Colombian mammoth stood up to about 14 feet at the shoulders and was about 13 to 15 feet long and weighed 18,000 pounds and sometimes as heavy as 22,000 pounds. The large tusks that they had were curved and could be as long as 16 feet. By a certain time in the epic of the Pleistocene epic, they had basically moved all over North America, stretching from Canada all the way down to Nicaragua and Honduras. And in our region here, they travel what is now called the Trinity River Basin. Back then, 28 to 40,000 years ago, it was referred to as the Trinity River Valley. Now, as they traveled along this valley foraging for food, there was evidence that showed their teeth formations, the structure of their teeth, was much like the modern day elephant. They had perfect teeth for chewing plants, which they had ridges on them to help them ground that up. Now, they grew sets of these teeth, and the older a mammoth got, the more sets that he developed, that they, they kept increasing. Now, it is said that a Colombian mammoth could live to be 70 to 80 years old. And they ate grasses, sedges, brush, trees, and woody plants. These teeth that they had were perfect for grinding that up for food. Now, like the modern day mammoths, elephants, mammoths would have to have, eat a lot of food each day to fuel or give that enormous body energy. It is said that they would forage for food from anywhere from 16 to 18 hours a day. That would leave very little time for resting, right? So they were constantly on the move looking for food. It is said that they also, during the day, would consume up to 150,000 calories per day. And that would take hundreds of pounds of food each day. Now let's look at some of these fossils that Ken Smith, and that's the young man that found these many, many years ago in one of the gravel pits down the road from us, Let's look at those and I'm going to ask you guys to act like paleontologists today to see if you can figure out what body part because these are remains. Okay. Now, this body part, very easy for you to figure out. This is a segment and it's not a model. This is a real remain from a Colombian mammoth that lived during the Pleistocene ep epic. Okay. Now, that tusk could be as long as 16 feet. And this is just a segment. It is a real segment of that tusk. Here I also have that was dug up was a hip socket. We can see the socket here and we can tell that part of the bone has been broken off. But this was recovered from one of the gravel pits in the same location. Here is a very interesting part, and you remember me talking about the teeth? This is a actual Colombian mammoth tooth. 
and we can see the ridges at the top of the tooth and it is flat. So that indicates that the type of consumer they were, they were herbivores, okay? They ate plant life. Now, here's the one that I want you guys to help me solve. Looking at these two bones, and they make up the same body part, what body part do you think this is? Hmm, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I'll give you a second or two to think about that. What do you think? Well, guess what? That's a toe. The Colombian mammoth had three toes, and this is the bone from one toe. It looks like a toe once you think about it, right? And then the last body part that I want to show you, it would be up just above the ankle or just above the toes. This is an ankle bone. They were quite large, weren't they? And they consumed a lot of vegetation. So during that time, evidently, in the Trinity River Valley, there was lots of vegetation for these mammoths to move down through there foraging for food. They moved in herds just like the modern day elements do in the continent of Africa. You guys have a good day. And if any of you have any questions, I bet Dr. Gorman can answer those for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And the question is, why did the Colombian mammoth go extinct? The Colombian mammoth disappeared at the end of the Pleistocene around 11,500 years ago, most likely as a result of habitat loss caused by climate change, hunting by humans, or a combination of both. I'm not too sure I'd really want to go hunting something that big, but now we're going to let um, Mrs. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Nash tell us about the crustaceous period. <laughs> Hello, welcome to my classroom. We're going back in time now from the Pleistocene, okay, back to the Cretaceous, okay, the end, the period that ends the age of dinosaurs. But before that ended, there were lots and lots of dinosaurs and lots of other animals too. And also, interestingly enough, an important development in the world of plants. So we can't go there in person. So let's look at some pictures and think about this very interesting period of time. A long, long time ago. Come in. There we go. Okay. So the Cretaceous is the period between 145 and 66 million years ago. By the beginning of the Cretaceous, the supercontinent Pangaea, that means all the continents were one giant continent called Pangaea, and it began rifting apart, breaking apart, and they split into several smaller continents. The global climate became cooler and seasons became more pronounced. The end of the Cretaceous marked the end of the age of dinosaurs when a giant asteroid hit Earth near the Yucatan Peninsula. Now, on the right hand side, you see a picture of what would become North America. But if you notice, Texas is down here somewhere. Here's the Gulf of Mexico. Here's the Yucatan where the asteroid's gonna hit. But where are we? We're right in the middle of what? A shallow sea, a very shallow sea that covered the entire middle section of the continent. Now, one of the most important events for terrestrial life is the evolution of flowering plants. This is when plants begin to have flowers. Before this, plants were ferns and conifers and cycads and others, but there were no flowers. And these plants were able to thrive in a wide variety of habitats, these new plants, and they today dominate the land surface of the planet. And these flowering plants are also connected to the evolution of many insects particularly the ones that pollinate the plants and use nectar for food. So some of the plants that were alive then, we have around today, like the um, cypress and ferns and horsetails, but, and conifers, but importantly, 
you can see here new plants coming along, flowers. Some of the most ancient flowering plants we have today are the magnolia. You might find that around in the water lily in a pond. And those are very, very ancient plants. Another important thing on a small scale that happened in the Cretaceous is the evolution of a great diversity of insects, including at first ants and butterflies, aphids, grasshoppers, gallwash, termites, and the eusocial bee, meaning bees that live in a colony like we know today. They all appear by the late Cretaceous. The first insect pollination was probably carried out by beetles. This and this pollination and nectar gathering marked the beginning of one of the greatest partnerships in the history of life on planet Earth. This is super important, that partnership, because it benefits both the plant and the insect. Now, insects, because they're small and, and don't have a bony skeleton, their fossil record is, is a little bit spotty, but they're often, and they're so tiny, they can be preserved in in amber, which is fossilized tree sap, like you see on the right. So there were lots of other animals besides insects. There were, um, of course, all the dinosaurs and a lot of uh, arthropods, other arthropods besides insects in the oceans and on land. And lurking in the shadows were the small mammals who would later inherit the earth from the dinosaurs. At this time, because the dinosaurs were still tromping around, they were hiding away, okay. they were small. And of course, because remember Texas was under the water, most of the fossils that we find here in Texas were things like these down here that were living in that shallow sea. So Texas, it's a great place to hunt for fossils because of so many of those, those creatures had shells which are really easily and well preserved in the fossil record. You can find them everywhere. Any road cut like this fellow here looking where they're making a road and you see those layers of sedimentary rock here, remember? Okay, it's where fossils form, the mud and sand laid down okay, over time in water, buried all these little guys, and then they, they fossilized. And you can find all these kinds of fossils right around here. My favorite, of course, is the ammonite, that one right there, They're my favorite. If you go west of Dallas, you can find some dinosaurs. Okay. Um, at the Dinosaur Valley State Park, and these Cretaceous area dinosaurs left footprints in what was mud, and then it became rock, and they were fossilized. And you can walk it's at the park, okay, some of the dinosaur tracks you'll find. And you can walk and wade and swim where the dinosaurs once walked. It's a great place to go, Dinosaur Valley State Park. Not very far away from Dallas, and it's a great place to go camp and spend the day, and there's even a good swimming hole. Another place to look for fossil, look at fossils is the um, Perot Museum in downtown Dallas. And you can see Archelon, the gigantic turtle. That fossil was found in Plano, just north of town. And you can also see Mosasaur, the giant ferocious reptile, ocean reptile. Okay. And if you go to, to Austin, at the Texas Museum, you can see the fossil, the fossil of the largest animal to ever fly on planet Earth, Quetzalcoatlus, okay, that were found in Big Bend. And they used to think they had to jump off cliffs to fly, but now they've decided, see what they're doing here, that they use those front limbs to, and their back legs together to push off into the air, that they could just leap into the air. These things were enormous, enormous. Now, let's think about some fossils that you might find. You can go down in a creek, okay, and you can find things like this. 
Ammonite I found. Often they're broken, but they're still really fancy. So these are really common. And this is a common echinoid. Another interesting thing to think about is the fact that some of these guys still have relatives around today living in the ocean. So if you go down to the, the Gulf Coast, to Galveston or Port Arthur, and you walk along the beach, you might find a sand dollar. And here's a fossil. You can see they both got the little star. Right? They are relative angels. You can go down and find these big shells like this. And then you might find a fossil like this. You can see that this animal is still here. Okay? Their ancient relatives are, have turned down. So the gyrotexentrus, a giant oyster. Pretty amazing. So lots of great things to do. And let's think about the flowering plants. So the flowering plants had seeds that lasted a long time. And in fact, these seeds may have been the secret to the survival of the mammals because these seeds, okay, in the aftermath of the asteroid strike, these seeds last a long time. And for a long time, there were no leaves for the dinosaurs to eat. There weren't to eat leaves. But these seeds, okay, for a little animal, could be the difference between starving and surviving. So we have a lot to think about. In fact, the plants for, particularly the flowering plants. If you have any questions, you can ask Dr. Gorman. Yes, Christian from Kramer had a question. When was the Cretaceous period? Uh, between 145 and 66 million years ago. That was a long time. And now Ms. Ramirez is going to tell you all about the Pennsylvania period. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez. And in this segment, we're going to go further back in time and we're going to learn about the Pennsylvania period. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys and we'll take a look at a couple of things. I also have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, when was the Pennsylvanian period? And the second question is, you should be able to give two examples of organisms that lived during this period. Uh, so we know that fossils are preserved evidence of past living organisms, and they can provide evidence about the environment at that time. So we know that Earth's surface is constantly changing and that fossils help us to understand Earth's history. So I'm going to show you guys a video. It's already been playing on the left side, uh, but you guys are going to pretend that you're a paleontologist and we learned that a paleontologist is a scientist that studies fossils. So you guys are going to examine the fossils to the left and think about what do you think they are. Also think about what clues can they give us about the environment of Texas at that time. So these fossils were collected here in Brownwood, Texas, and I'm going to replay the video so that you guys can make your observations and your predictions as to what you think these fossils uh, came from and what they might tell us about the environment of Texas uh, during the Pennsylvania period. So let me play that video one more time. I'm not going to tell you what they are right now, so I just want you guys to make your observations and your predictions on what you think they are and where they came from. I have provided the relative sizes for you guys. Um, also, now most of these were going to be really tiny. So you can see on this fossil, it was only three and a half centimeters at the widest end, and it kind of tapered down uh, and got smaller. This one should probably be the easiest one for you guys to identify. Those were really tiny, skinny uh, fossils, and they had these little spikes coming out of them. These were probably the tiniest fossils that were collected um, in this little display. And that is the biggest fossil that was collected uh, for this display. And it was about six to eight centimeters long, kind of wide at one end and then got skinny toward the other end. So think about what do you think those things were, and also think about what do you think the environment was like here in Texas uh, during the Pennsylvania period. So I'm going to go ahead and show you guys what they came from. 
So here's some examples of what those organisms look like uh, when they were alive. So the first we're gonna take a look at is this one. It is corn coral. It is not a plant, it is actually an animal. Um, and it is a solitary form of a coral. And it gets the name horn coral because it looks like a bull's, it looks like a horn. So it's kind of looks like funneled, it's wide at one end and gets skinny toward the other end. Uh, so that's how it gets its name. It actually went extinct at the end of the Permian. And we know that corals are animals. They're usually sessile, which means uh, they don't really move. They anchor themselves to the bottom of uh, the ocean or the sea floor. And the way they capture their food is they have these little tentacles here. And those little tentacles uh, will grab uh, any plankton or food that's floating around. And we know that when we find these as fossils, that we're mostly finding this hard part right here. So the coral polyp will secrete a rock-like substance and it's a, a type of skeleton made out of calcium carbonate. And this is what is typically well-preserved. So this is the part that you're gonna find. This soft fleshy tentacles uh, decays really easily. So we don't really find a lot of well-preserved specimens of the whole thing. Uh, so that's the horn coral. Another cool one is the crinoid. So the one that kind of looked like a cylinder with the rings. Uh, so this is not a plant, it's actually an animal as well. And so if you take a look at these fossil specimens here, what part of this animal do you think it came from? So we know that crinoids are marine animals and they're in the phylum Echinodermata. And you guys are actually familiar with that group of animals because if you've seen a starfish or a sea urchin, uh, Miss Nash showed you guys the sand dollar, those are all in the same phylum Echinodermata. Um, this is species is technically called extant. So there's actually still some species of crinoids that are still alive today. And then uh, most fossils that we're finding of the crinoids are gonna be of the stem. So this is actually uh, parts of the stem. They call it the stem of the crinoid, but again, it's not a plant, it's an animal. Um, so here's uh, what's referred to as the stem. And then this soft fleshy part right here, again, because it's that soft tissue, um, it's not as easily well preserved as other parts of that organism. So that's the crinoid and these are actually very common uh, to find here around Texas. The other ones would be shark teeth and then uh, we of course know with the sharks um, and then uh, the sea urchin spine. So the very long uh, kind of look like a stick um, fossil with the little spikes that you guys saw in the video. Those are the spines of the sea urchin. Again, it's in the same group echinoderms as the crinoid and the sand dollar. So there's the sea urchin spines. Uh, the other ones are our brachiopods. They are also a marine animal. Kind of looks like it has two shells or two hats. So those are some common Texas fossils. Again, those were all found here in Texas. So based upon these fossils, we know that the environment here in Texas during the Pennsylvania time was actually a marine type environment. So let's take a look at when exactly the Pennsylvania period was. So with Mrs. Nash, she talked to you guys about the Cretaceous. Now in the Pennsylvania, we're going even further back in time. Here we are at the Pennsylvania period on our diagram. Um, and we have what's called the Carboniferous uh, period. And that Carboniferous period is composed of the Pennsylvania and also the Mississippian uh, period. And we know that uh, the Pennsylvania period uh, is in the Paleozoic era. So now we're in a different era from, era from the other two teachers. Uh, so we know that the Pennsylvania period uh, was anywhere between 323.2 to about 298.9 million years ago. So we are talking a long, long time ago. And if we took a look at this map over here, uh, we know that according to this map and according to our fossil records, we know that parts of Texas was actually a shallow sea and we also have uh, areas that were a swamp land. So the Pennsylvania period was marked by shallow seas and swamps in the US. And something interesting that I didn't know, uh, there was actually a, a long, millions of years ago, there was actually a mountain range that ran through Texas. And that was the Washita Mountains. Now parts of this mountains are still in existence in Oklahoma and Arkansas. However, uh, over the course of those million years here in Texas, a lot of the mountain range has been buried uh, for, for Texas. Uh, but that is interesting to know that of millions of years ago, there was a mountain range that went right through Texas. Now we know in this little video here, this is gonna be a simulation of what it 
might have looked like during the Carboniferous period. Now remember the Pennsylvanian period is just a subsection of the Carboniferous period. And we know that over time, the abundant plant and animal remains during this period, they were buried and compressed. And that is what actually formed fossil fuels. And we know that fossil fuels are used because they're an energy rich uh, resource formed from the remains of those once living organisms during this period. And of course, we can see here in this simulation, we have coal swamps. So coal forms from the remains of those dead plants. Uh, eventually over time, they get covered by heavy layers of sediment, which increases temperature and pressure. And that is how we get coal formation. So carboniferous means coal bearing. And that is um, marked, that's one of the big highlights of this area, of this era is that coal form formation. Um, so that, I thought this was a pretty cool simulation. And here is Brown County where those fossils were found. So I'm gonna move over to our next slide. And I have a quick challenge for you guys. It's a family trip. So see if maybe one weekend you guys can go down to Mineral Wells Fossil Park. It's not that far away. It's only about an hour to an hour and a half from Dallas, depending upon where you're coming from in Dallas. Um, but it's free, it is open to the public and you can see the hours here. Uh, but that is actually where I have collected some fossils as well. Again, you can find some of those cool crinoids and some of the uh, little bivalve shells and shark teeth and things like that. Um, so if you can't go, that's totally fine. At least go visit their website, mineralwellsfossilpark.com or their Facebook page and do some research on some of those common Texas fossils. So I'm gonna stop our screen share. Oops, let me pull it back. There we go. Uh, so we're going to stop our screen share. And if you do decide to go fossil hunting, some things you might need would be things like a rock hammer. And if you don't have a rock hammer, you can use a regular hammer if that's all you have. Um, you might even use like a screwdriver to help you uh, pick at some of the smaller pieces. And of course, if you're going to use those tools, you also might need some safety glasses uh, to help you as you might you know, break through some of the rock to find some of those interesting fossils. And of course, you'll need like a Ziploc bag or something that put your fossils in. Uh, so it is fun to go fossil hunting um, and there's quite a few places here in Texas where you can go. So that's all I have for you guys today on the Pennsylvanian period. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and give it back to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Ramirez. And a student asked, what was the climate like during the Pennsylvania period? Much like here today. It was ice on both poles, the North and the South Pole and the temperature, temperate zones between uh, with the wet tropics near the equator, the earth was in an ice age. So it was very much like it is today, uh, here nowadays. All right, now Ms. Fuller is gonna tell you about extinction events. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm greeting you from the Environmental Education Center uh, eco theater. You can see the uh, 3D map of Texas behind me. And this is what we're going to be discussing. We're going to be discussing e extinction events. And uh, I want to show you a fossil. This is, uh, remember when Miss Ramirez was showing you the wheat forams? Well, this is a rock, a sedimentary rock that is completely loaded with those wheat forams. They're one-celled organisms. That's a pretty big one cell, isn't it? And what you're looking at is the test, which is the outer covering. And these tests were made of things like calcite or silica or uh, aragonite, things like that. Well, there are about 10,000 different kinds of uh, uh, foraminifera now, and there are actually a lot more before. And well, why don't we have the same amount? Well, because we've had some extinction events and many, many species of foraminifera have uh, ceased to exist. So I'm gonna share my screen with you and uh, we're gonna go through uh, the five uh, extinction ev events in the past and then look at one in the present. So let me share my screen. So there have been five major extinction events and we're in the midst of a sixth. So down at the bottom, you see some of your favorite things, Velociraptor and trilobites, yay. 
Let's keep some essential questions in mind as we go through the program, which was the most devastating extinction event. And number two, are we in an extinction event now? Why or why not? And at the bottom, you see two things that have really led uh, many of the extinction events, uh, volcanic activity, which throws tremendous amount of uh, carbon dioxide and sulfuric gases, that sort of thing, into the atmosphere, and also asteroid hits. So the first big uh, extinction event, uh, it's, it was the second largest, doesn't answer your question from uh, the previous slide, it occurred about 450 to 440 million years ago at the Ordovician Silurian transition. That means when one period ended and another began. In 2020, last year, paleontologists determined that the, the cause of this uh, second largest uh, um, extinction event was global warming due to volcanism and anoxia. Now what anoxia is, as you know, fish have to breathe oxygen with their gills. Well, if there's not enough dissolved oxygen in the water, they, they will die. So anoxia is not enough uh, dissolved oxygen in the water. About 70% of all species became extinct. And during this time, this is where we first see those foraminifera, these types of protists with the hard test, um, where we first see crinoids and where we first see the bryzoans. Okay, now the second event was the late Devonian extinction event. And this was 375 to 360 million years ago uh, near the Devonian carboniferous transition. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna say about 70% uh, of all species became extinct. And the, the event itself lasted a really long time. It lasted about 20 million years. And they have not identified a single cause, but a series of events, including asteroid impact, global anoxia, plate tectonic sea level change, climate change. And during this time, we see fish, we see ammonites. Miss uh, Nash uh, told you about the ammonites and these brachiopods, these very distinctive looking uh, or sea organisms uh, were common during this time. And uh, these uh, very interesting looking fish. Okay. And here we go. Now, event number three is the answer to question number one. It was called the Great Dying. It was at the end of the Permian. It was about 252 million years ago. It killed 96% of all species alive on the planet at that time. This is when the trilobite became extinct. Now, the trilobite had been successful for about 260, maybe 240 million years. And he's, uh, he's a very distinctive looking uh, creature. You can find them really, really tiny. and You can find them really big. Um, they are arthropods. When you're in the second grade, you learned about the arthropods. Uh, well, he is the fifth group. Actually, you'd be the first group because he came long before insects and arachnids and myriapods and crustaceans. But uh, this distinctive organism came to a halt uh, after the great dying. Uh, they think it was brought about by extensive volcanism in the region that we now call Siberia. And the global warming as a result of this, of all the heat from the sun getting trapped in the atmosphere, rose the temperature of the oceans 14.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're wringing our hands right now over uh, oceanic temperature rise of uh, 1.5 de degrees Fahrenheit. You can imagine what the oceans must have looked like when they were that hot. The oceans absorb huge amount of carbon dioxide, 
which made it very difficult for the sea creatures to grow shells. The, the oceans became very acidic and they couldn't grow skeletons and dissolved oxygen, like, anoxia, like we had mentioned before, uh, was very pronounced. Uh, the anoxia was pronounced, not the DO, the DO was reduced. So down at the bottom, you see three guys here that went extinct. Uh, you've got um, trilobite and rugosa, the horn coral, and then of course, our beloved Dimetrodon, who was more closely related to the mammals than he was to the reptile. Even though he looks like a reptile, he was not one. He predated the reptiles by about 60 million years. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing going. Event number four was the end of the Triassic, uh, two, mm, 201.3 million years ago. 70 to 75% of the ex uh, species became extinct. Most large uh, amphibians died. This left uh, the uh, environment open for dinosaurs and mammals. Uh, it left very little competition for the, the dinosaurs. And this was a the cause of this one was acidification of the oceans and global warming. And just about all that was left were plants, dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and mammals. And event number five, the KPG extinction, they used to call it KT, now they call it KPG. K stands for Cretaceous and PG stands for Paleogene. This was 66 million years ago, 75% of all species became extinct. We've got two lovely uh, examples at the bottom, the Ammonite and the Mosasaur. Um, all non-avian dinosaurs died and mammals and birds remained and became the dominant land animals. Um, and as you know, this was caused by an asteroid that hit off the, co the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula and um, in the Gulf of Mexico. And the, the event we're having right now, we're in the midst of one, it's, a, it's a, during the period called the Holocene. It's the result of human activity, burning of fossil fuels, the release of methane, freon, chlorofluorocarbons and carbon dioxide as a result of the uh, making of uh, cement. Uh, the halogen extinction has been driven by human population growth and overconsumption of natural resources. Uh, also uh, overhunting, loss of habitat, a lot of invasive species, a lot of animals have gone extinct, including the passenger pigeon. You see Martha's picture in the middle at the bottom. She was the last living passenger pigeon. Uh, when uh, the Europeans and the Africans came to America uh, about 400 years ago, there were billions, billions with a B of passenger pigeons. Now we have zero and Martha was the last one. Over on the left, you see Tasmanian tigers and they held a niche very similar to our coyote does here. Uh, and then over on the right-hand side, you have a wildebeest. So um, there is much we can do individually and then corporately, and we need to do it. I'm gonna go ahead and get out of my screen and stop sharing. If you have any questions about the, the big, the big five and now the number six that we're in as far as extinction events are concerned, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to help you with those questions. Have a good day. Question is, describe the mass extinction. When at least half of all species die out in a relative short time, they have occupied only a handful of times, has, has occurred only a handful of times over the course of our planet's history. The largest mass extinction event happened about 250 million years ago when perhaps 95% of all species went extinct. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fuller, for covering that very thoroughly for us. Now I am going to share my screen. Okay, uh, during this virtual field trip, students identified fossils as evidence of past living organism and the nature of the environments at the time using models. Uh, Mr. Monroe discussed the Columbian mammoth. Ms. Nash covered the Cretaceous period. Ms. Ramirez talked to you about the Pennsylvania period. And Ms. Fuller just got through covering 
extinction events. Thank you, teachers. How did we do? If you would go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a very short form, send it back to us. We would appreciate it. Thank you guys for joining us today. You have a great rest of the day. More importantly, have a great rest of your life. Thank you again.